Hello, and thank you for choosing time to join in today. My name is Gillian Saunders-Smith. In this talk, I want to make the case on why, when we as lecturers create and teach our courses, we should aim to create an inclusive, equitable environment by design, focusing on our students who, like me, identify as neurodiverse. To understand why I'm making this plea, I first want to talk about neurodiversity and labeling. Currently, neurodiversity is often only formally recognized if there's a formal medical label. This also has consequences on how, within education, neurodiversity is looked at. Allow me to explain. When higher education institutes talk about the support they have in place for neurodiverse students, they often only talk about students who not only have received a formal medical diagnosis, such as, for instance, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, anxiety or depression, but also who have chosen to disclose their condition and have decided to ask for reasonable, individual adjustments. This group, however, is only one part of the neurodiverse community and the part that is often most visible. Help for them is available, but even they will tell you that asking for and arranging this support is often a burdensome, repetitive journey that requires patience and energy on top of the daily coping with your limitations. The neurodiverse community, however, is much larger than those of us with formal labels. There is a large part of the neurodiverse community that does not need or have a diagnosis. If someone is still able to function, often using all their talents to compensate for having a brain that works differently from most, they live their lives happily, but tiredly. Happily, that is, until they reach the point that they can also no longer cope and either seek help before getting stuck or hit the proverbial wall and are forced to get help. That is, if there's help available, as not all conditions are universally recognized and the waiting list to get diagnosed and get help are very long in this post-COVID era. Although genetic factors definitely also play a role, many psychologists will tell you that many diagnoses would not have happened or happened much later in life if the environmental factors which surround people would have been more inclusive. Education and the educational environment are such environmental factors. In addition, there's a third group. Students with labels who choose not to disclose and students who suspect they may have a condition but who choose not to get diagnosed. Why? Because sadly having a label and disclosing a label is not without its consequences. There is a risk of being disparaged by others, not taken seriously or being excluded because of a poorly informed public opinion. Media often publish articles calling into question the high number of diagnoses usually followed by the suggestion that people are deliberately after a label to obtain an unfair advantage. These kind of opinions are extremely painful to experience if you've been diagnosed and need additional accommodations to function. As anyone with a formal neurodiverse diagnosis will know, the road to getting diagnosed and getting help is a long one, and once diagnosed, we are not magically cured, we just have to learn to adjust our lives accordingly. We are grateful for even small accommodations, as life is hard enough. Getting a formal medical diagnosis can also have other consequences. Depending on where in the world you live, you may face exclusion or higher premiums when buying insurance, additional medical checks when getting a driving license, or, when also on medication, tons of paperwork when you need to cross a border, or knowing you will fail random roadside drug tests and need to always be prepared to prove your innocence. These students accept that not getting diagnosed or not disclosing makes life harder for them, but the question is at what cost? You may ask, why should we care as educators? The simple answer is because it's the right thing to do. Secondly, it's the law. Based on the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, these students are entitled to enjoy the same education as their neurotypical classmate with the same chances of success. And if those arguments are not convincing enough, there is also a substantial economic argument to be made. Most people are unaware that an estimated 15 to 20 percent of the world's population are neurodivergent. In addition, there is research that indicates that within, the that within engineering education, neurodivergents are overrepresented, meaning that more than 25 of our percent of our students, and likely also our colleagues, are neurodivergents. That is at least one in every four engineering students. All students with an above average intelligence who have made it through secondary education, who we have admitted into our degree programs and who we are responsible for. 
At the time when the world is short of engineers to help solve the challenges that lie ahead of us, we cannot afford to allow a potential of 25% of our students to fail because our education and our educational environment is not inclusive and supportive enough. And who knows? The 75% neurotypical students may benefit too. Label or no label, what all these students have in common is that daily functioning in life costs them much more energy than others. They are the first to run into problems if the environmental conditions around them are not ideal. But differently, they are the canaries in the mine of our programs in terms of study ability and study climate. Most of us educators, including myself until a few years ago, are often not even aware of the unintended exclusion that may occur due to our lack of awareness and knowledge of how to design inclusive engineering education and education spaces. Because of course I'm not arguing for individual accommodations for 25% of our students. I am arguing that we need to redesign our education. If we design our education, taking the needs of neurodiverse students into account, we will need less accommodations, less exceptions, and make a positive contribution to mental health of everyone. So how can we do this as lecturers? Far be it from me to have all the knowledge on this topic. I don't. Because despite having university teaching qualifications, I was never trained in designing inclusive education. But there's hope. There are fantastic people out there from CAST who have developed a model called Universal Design for Learning, also known as UDL, to help train educators in designing inclusive education. The Universal Design for Learning model centers on providing multiple means in three key areas. Engagement, representation and action and expression the why, the what and the how of learning, which I can recommend to anyone to equate themselves with. This UDL model does not just cover neurodiversity, it is a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people, and is discipline independent. You can find the website with the model via this QR code, or by typing cast.org. Thankfully, more and more countries and more and more universities offer forms of UDL support and training, and hopefully this trend will continue. I hope UDL will rapidly become the standard when we design our teaching so that truly inclusive educational environments can be created. Before I stop talking, I have one final request, whether you are already using UDL or not. When teaching, please let us all be aware of our own pitfalls as lecturers and humans. Realize that every time we cut a corner in creating and delivering our teaching and assessment, that every time we accept substandard environments and facilities for our classes, that every time we accept that we are not facilitated in creating UDL-proof teaching by our institution, we limit students in the accessibility of their learning. And every time we don't, we will have the gratitude and the respect of some of the most wonderful, very worthwhile students who will go on and do great things. Thank you for hearing me out.